everyone. I'm TJ Schinners. This is Brandon Wagner and our other partners, Aidan Murphy, run the computer. And our project was the acceleration of video compression by improved motion estimation. So first off, a little bit about what video compression actually is. At its core, you want to have a smaller uh, file. You want less bits in the original format. You want to reduce the video storage costs and transmission times. So some of the uncompressed video that we were working with in this project, even though it was a very short clip, clip maybe 30 seconds, it could be huge, a gig or more. We want to be able to compress that down and easily be able to save it on a flash drive and take it around with us. Uh, so what we did is reduce, uh, we achieved this by reducing some of the redundancies in the video file. Uh, some of the big ones there are spatial image compression, which is pixels in the same frame that are similar. And there's temporal motion compensation, which is what we use for this project, which is a group of pixels in one frame are very similar to that in another. So if you can imagine your hands being recorded in a video moving back and forth, that same shape of pixels is going to appear in every frame. It's just going to be shifted a little bit. So most of our compression is obtained in that temporal motion. So motion estimation process, it again, is the process of finding these identical pixel groups between different frames in a video. We would partition each frame into a 16 by 16 pixel block. Each block is predicted from some sort of previously encoded pixels. Over here we have some earlier encoded frame and a reference block we're using. And you can see the motion vector, which is simply some x, y coordinate that will let us translate that earlier encoded block to our current block we're looking at. The cost that's associated with that vector tells us how good of a match that is. A very low cost means it's a great match. A high cost means it's not very well correlated. So our compression is achieved by, instead of re-encoding, re-encoding each of those blocks, simply saving these motion vectors to show us where we're looking. So our base code for this was the X264 video encoder. It's an open source library. You can find it at this URL. It's written mostly in C and assembly. Uh, some other things we used, FFmpeg and Handbrake, also use this codec. Uh, our sponsor, Dr. Ratner here, works at Lyrical Labs, and his encoder improves on this base X264 one. It uses a two-pass well, two system. The first one is a low-resolution video runs very quickly, and then the second one is a high resolution that will output our final product. And our potential for speeding this up is to be able to use those low resolution motion vectors, save them up, save them to a file, read them in, and then try to lever leverage them in our high resolution. So again, first and foremost, our objective was to modify the code, get this to have the low resolution pass, save out our motion vector data, and then read that in from a file and apply it to a high resolution pass. We hoped that this would speed up about 15% over the original code and have minimal quality loss. And we define that in PSNR, or peak signal to noise ratio. We want to keep that under 0.1%. And then finally, we wanted to modularize this, make sure it could be applied to a general X264 encoder and not just specifically to one product. So beginning with our method of how we actually did this. The low resolution pass takes in an uncompressed video, performs our macro block motion estimation analysis that we talked about earlier. It's got a pretty fast running time. You'll see a little bit later uh, both the low and the high pass run and it's a lot quicker. And then for each frame, we'll output motion vector data to a CSV or comma separated value file. And that will include XY motion vector information the cost associated with each of those vectors, uh, information about the reference, where we're actually looking, and the average cost for the frame that we're using. So in the second pass of the encoding is where we're using the high resolution video, and during that motion estimation is where we're going to read in the data we saved from the first pass. And then we need to correlate those low resolution motion vectors from the first pass to the current macro block that we're on on the second pass. And then we need to make a decision of how we're going to apply those motion vectors. Like TJ was saying, if they're low, that means a good reference is found on a, the low resolution, so that means we can probably use it in the high resolution. If a high cost was, uh, they found a poor matching reference block in the low resolution, 
So therefore, we unlikely we can apply that to the high resolution pass. So here's kind of a flow chart of what we're doing. Taking in the uncompressed video, low res on the first pass to the encoder. There's some frame setup and macro block partitioning that takes place, and then the actual analysis happens where we output those motion vectors. And then after we find the motion vectors, the frame is encoded, and this process repeats until the final video is output compressed. And on the second pass, we have the high res video coming in. The same frame setup happens in the partitioning. And then here's where we do our high resolution analysis where we read in the saved data. And then we need to make a decision of how to use that data right here. So if the cost is low enough, we can directly assign that motion vector from the low res to the high resolution macro block. That's the first option. The second option is if that cost is a little higher, we might be able to perform a local search around that motion vector to find the correct reference block on the high resolution. Otherwise, if the data is not good enough, the cost is too high, we have to reverse the full search and to find the motion vector. And then once we have the motion vector, the frame is encoded for each frame, and, and then um, that output video is compressed. So we'll talk a little bit about that threshold decision to make that three-way tree in that graphic. Um, that's based on the low resolution motion vector cost, and that's just simply the sum of absolute differences of the pixel values between the reference frame and the original frame block, and then plus the how expensive it is to encode the motion vector. So if that motion vector was below an assignment threshold, we will directly assign the scaled low resolution motion vector to the high resolution macro block. And I say scale because we'll have to multiply each dimension by two since the resolution is twice as much. And if it's below a local threshold, which is going to be slightly higher, then it means that the matching reference block is likely to be near the low resolution motion vector. So we can perform a local search centered to that motion vector instead of doing the full search, which will greatly increase the time to find the motion vector we're looking for. Otherwise, like I said, you have to do the full search, and that's what the X264 encoder currently does for every macro block. So we won't get an increase of speed in this case. So these are the two cases where we're going to increase the speed of the encoder. Here's a graphical example of the motion vectors. You can see you have your current block we're on, and this motion vector just tells you the translation. So it's a 4, negative 4 pixel shift to to the reference block here. And then the high resolution, that macro block actually corresponds to four macro blocks in the high resolution because double of the resolution. And you can see that the reference blocks over here don't exactly match up to the reference block used in the low resolution. So there we couldn't directly assign. We'd have to do the local search because they're in the neighborhood of that 8, negative 8 once you scale it, but they're not exactly. So you do a local search there to greatly increase the time to find that motion vector. So then we had to decide how to set the actual threshold values to make the decision. First, we tried a single universal threshold, which didn't work out very well and didn't see the results we were looking for. So then we tried to use more information by setting thresholds for each macro block type. There's three types, an I, P, and B block. We don't worry about the I block because there's no reference frame with that. It's fully specified, so it doesn't have a motion vector. A P block is simply there's one reference frame it uses, and a B block has two reference frames. So then we used hard-coded threshold values based on these types for each video, and that's worked pretty well, but we had to change these hard-coded values for each test video. So we wanted a universal threshold we could set, so we based it dynamically based on the average threshold cost for each frame on the low resolution. So here's an example of how we set the thresholds. Our P assignment threshold, for example, was set as the average P block cost at the low resolution times the P assignment percentage. And those values in orange are what we played with to try to find the best trade-off between speed up and quality loss. And this next slide shows some example settings we had. You can see if we set the threshold too high, we'd get good speed up, but the quality would drop because we'd be using bad motion vectors from a low resolution that we can't really, not really supposed to apply. But if we set it too low, then we'd get the quality we want, but we won't achieve the speed up because it'd be doing more of those full estimation searches. So these values in yellow here were generally just seemed to be the best universal values for all of our test videos to get a trade-off between speed increase and quality loss. So our last objective that we stated was modularizing the code because we wanted this to actually plug into existing X264 library and we wanted anybody to be able to use this. So we tried two approaches. The first approach 
is what happens sometimes earlier in this library is in open source code sometimes they do include .c which is not really good programming practice. It's kind of like a quick and dirty way to get things done. So the problem that this presented, or we try to do this and just include this in our file instead of making a header file with everything else. The problem with this though is that you come to multiple right redeclarations. So if we use a function in one file and then include .c twice, it throws compiler errors. So what we decided to do was to write a bunch of preprocessor code to basically throw a flag so that whenever we got to our functions that we would specifically go back in and redefine or define for the first time the functions that we needed to use. And at first we thought this worked, but then we actually noticed that there's a significant loss in PSNR after really examining the tests. So then we went back to like the standard practice to do just make a .h file of every function that we modified or created. So now we have a .h file for all the functions that we made, and uh, additionally to that, there's a rate distortion file in the library that exists now that we made a .h file for, so that we use that, and then that won't throw the compilers either. Um, after testing it, we found out that the results matched exactly, so we did what we wanted. So generally our results were a 15 to 25 percent speed increase from the normal, and the PSNR was between 0.01 percent and 2.2 percent. So our initial goal was 0.1 percent, but after talking to Dr. Ratner, we decided that within that range is definitely fine. As you'll see later, we'll actually view some of the videos that we encoded versus the normal encoder. And to the naked eye, you can't tell differences or anything between, the, between that ratio. So two of the clips that we used, our best clip, Harbor, is basically just a scene of boats coming in and out and the waves going. And with this clip, we got a 25% speed increase with only 0.01% PSNR loss. And our other clip, movie trailer, which is basically a bunch of lots of motion, fast cutscenes, uh, with 0.018 PSNR loss and a 15% speed increase. Here's some more results of videos that we encoded. And we got these videos from like a, a benchmarking site that you usually uh, take these videos down and you can really run them through and then test it. So we have two sports which have lots of motion. Um, we, those sped up, you know, 18 to 21% with uh, a decent PSNR loss. And example clips like City and Silent. City was a, a bird's eye view of a city with cars going in and out, people moving, and it's really very little motion. So we got a 15% speed increase, but something else like Silent, where it's just someone doing sign language. There's literally no cutscenes or transitions, it's just someone's hands moving back and forth. So that leaves little room to really improve because since we use motion estimation, if there's not much motion, then you can't really speed it up. So now we're going to show our code running, and this is sped up a little bit. Uh, but So the first pass is our low resolution pass, and right now it's going through and going through the low resolution video, which is half the size of the high res, and storing all the motion vectors out to the CSV file. And now it's starting the high res where it assigns anything that it can that meets the thresholds. And then if it doesn't meet the threshold, it goes to the local search. And then after that, to the 16 by 16 that fails all the searches. And you'll see here in a second that the PSNR is produced and the frames per second are produced. And we use that against the standard video encoder to really show. And those are the uh, graphs before. So. Our average PSNR is listed here, and our frames per second is 6.35. So then we can make the graphs and, and really analyze the results to find the threshold. So now here are two videos, one with our improved XC64 encoded and our regular original XC64. And even with a loss of 0.2, you really can't tell any difference. Um, with significant loss, you usually see artifacts, maybe like a distortion, pixels in the images. And acknowledgments, we'd like to acknowledge Dr. Ed Ratner for helping us out, really like guiding us this ocean of open source code and helping us when we kind of struggled. And Professor Curry for really having us set ambitious goals, something that's not impossible, it's attainable, that we can uh, reach and really go after. So, any questions? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so here we go. No questions.